Jim, can you stand up where everybody can see you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me just say briefly, Jim is, um, this is a unique situation because of course we've hired him to play piano, but we've also hired him to help us as an assistant pastor. Now you say, how do we do that? Well, for the last 23 years, he's been a pastor in the PCA, uh, a pastor in Greenville uh, at Horizon Church. In fact, he planted and pastored Horizon for the last 23 years, and the Lord sort of has moved him along. I used the word retirement uh, a few weeks ago, and he said, no, I don't know that I want to retire. Um, in fact, at Presbytery, I was asking him, well, what do, you, what do you want to do as the next step? And he said, well, I'm looking. And um, I asked him, I said, well, would you ever consider playing piano? I had remembered how well he had played over the years. And um, he said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, great, let's talk. And so we've talked over uh, the weeks uh, since then, since the end of July. And um, he's met with our session. And then Thursday night, we uh, voted to call him as our assistant pastor. So we're very excited that he would be here. You've been, been enjoying his ministry to us on the piano and uh, look forward to seeing him minister to us by way of visitation and teaching and preaching in the days to come. I want to also mention Deborah, his wife. Wave at us, Deborah. We're so glad that she's with us as well. They have two children, two grown children, and uh, we do welcome you to our church. Thank you so much. Andrew? Again, it is uh, good to be uh, able to worship our Lord again again today. I do have a few announcements, although I can't find them. There they are. Um, this evening uh, is going to be an evening here at Mount Calvary filled uh, with fellowship and prayer. Um, we invite all of you uh, to come back this evening uh, for our worship service. We are um, uh, going to do our ice cream social following the evening service, and the evening service is going to be focused on prayer, on especially uh, the back-to-school aspect of prayer. So praying for our kids, um, for teachers, for assistants, um, and for staff at the school. So um, we're very excited for this event. Well, we encourage you to come. Uh, and please, if you are able, bring some ice cream as well. Uh, also, <clears throat> just a reminder, during our evening service, um, we, begun, we began last week uh, with our children's Christmas program rehearsals. Uh, so that will continue this week. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, the children are with us during worship uh, for the singing, um, but then when <clears throat> pastor begins the sermon, they go off um, and start their Christmas rehearsal. Um, also, we kicked off spur groups last week. Uh, we're excited for our meeting again tonight at 5 p.m., so we hope to see all the middle schoolers and high schoolers there. <clears throat> um, another announcement, Hearts football game uh, that the youth are hoping to go to, Lord willing, uh, is this Friday. Um, so please, if you haven't signed up for that, please let me know, um, <clears throat> ho hopefully today, either in Sunday school or Wednesday. Um, space is limited for that, uh, so please sign up for that as soon as possible. And then finally, in two Sundays on October 3rd, the children's ministry team is inviting all parents to join them during the Sunday school hour to talk about God's call um, in upbringing our children in the discipline of the Lord and teaching them about the Lord, um, but also about upcoming events and activities, including VBS uh, 2022. So please uh, plan on being at that Sunday school uh, October 3rd. This morning, I, I hope that you are eager and glad to be here, eager and glad to be in the presence of our God. So often we come to worship, um, we come to worship our great, awesome Lord, and yet we come so distracted, either from uh, yesterday, um, or last week, or even uh, thinking about this coming week. So often we come purely out of routine. Um, we're here bodily, um, but aren't here uh, emotionally. Um, we're not here uh, in desiring and gladness. So often we forget who we are here to worship. So often we forget what the Lord has done. And Psalm 92 tells us, that it is good to thank the Lord, to sing praises to the Lord, and to declare who God is and what he has done. So Psalm 92 turns our eyes and our ears from our weak and turns them to God. And let this psalm do exactly that for you this morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. 
And I don't know if you guys uh, are used to this right now. Uh, we're going to pray, but uh, the first part of this prayer, I actually hope uh, to be silent. Um, so a every one of us has one or more distractions that we walked in this door with uh, this morning. So um, I am encouraging you. We're going to pray. The first part of this prayer is going to be silent. I encourage you, um, beg the Lord. Uh, Lord, take away the distraction. Take away everything that's hindering me from being glad here from um, being joyful, for being excited to worship you. So the first part of our prayer is going to be silent. You just begging the Lord, take away those distractions. Let me, help me to be glad to be here. And then I will um, verbally begin prayer as well. So let's pray to our Lord. Lord God, we ought to not be here for ourselves. Lord, for our own gain, for our own interests. Lord, we ought to be here for you because we have a great God who's done marvelous things. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would take away our distractions, that you would take away our selfish thoughts, that you'd let our attention and our joy and our gladness be directed to you our Lord, and our God. Lord, help our thanksgiving, our praise, our recounting of you to be with a whole heart. Lord, help us to delight, to praise, to worship you, to enjoy our awesome God, because you are worthy. You are great, you are loving, you are merciful. Lord, direct our hearts, our eyes, our ears, our attention to you. Lord, even as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, Behold Our God.
on uh, Wednesday as a youth group, uh, we looked uh, for the third time at election and spent most of our time uh, just reminding ourselves who God is, especially in the face of who we are, right? Uh, we are insignificant, we are changing, we are finite, we are dependent. Um, and yet God is none of those things, right? God is glorious, God is great. Um, and so often uh, we forget, uh, we think that we are at the center of the world, uh, we think that God is the problem in this world, rather it's the opposite. God is the center of this world. It's all for his glory, it's all for his purposes. And we are the ones who brought sin along. We are the problem. Um, and it is good for us to affirm who God is, uh, to be reminded he is the center of this world. He is good. He is gracious. He is loving. Christian, what is God? God is a spirit. In and of himself, infallible being, glory, blessedness, and perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. I invite the deacons to come all the way forward. Um, again, I feel like I say this every week, but it is a privilege uh, that we get to give back uh, just a portion to the Lord uh, because of all the great, amazing things that he has done for us, especially sending his son to die on the cross for our sins. Let's thank God for that, um, and let's, let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for the life that you've given us, for the relationship that you've restored between yourself and your people. We thank you that you sent your son to pay the price, to be the penalty. Lord, we thank you for this redemption. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the relationship that you've given us. We thank you for our eternal paradise uh, that we can't expect to enter into soon. Lord, you've given us so many good things, Lord, and we give now back just a portion, just a small percentage of the things that you've given to us. And Lord, we dedicate those to you. We pray that they would be used for your honor and for your glory, that your name would be spread, that your name would be able to continue being preached from this pulpit. Lord, that your name would be spread throughout this area and throughout the world. Lord, please bless those who have given. Lord, and please bless those who will receive. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's go to our, our Lord in a time of prayer for, of God's people. Lord God, it is such an amazing, such a marvelous, such a wonderful thing that you would take us weak, worthless, sinful people and that you would come to us. 
and that you'd bring us into a relationship with you. It's an amazing thing that Jesus would cleanse us and bring us into your favor. That you promise to be with us. That you promise to hear us. That you promise to love us and to take care of us. Lord, it's an amazing thing that you are our God and that we can be called your people. It's remarkable. It's undeserved. And Lord, if we really think about it, it's ridiculous. That you would love us so much. That you would care for us so much. That you would pay such a price to be with us. And yet, Lord, you have made us your people. And we thank you for that and we praise you. And now, Lord, we come to you in prayer as you have commanded us. Lord, we pray for Heidi Blake, Terry Bennett's granddaughter, who's in the hospital with COVID. Lord, she has been fighting for weeks now. And we do praise you and thank you that there is slow progress. Lord, we praise you and thank you that it seems as if in just a few days she'll be able to uh, go to just a regular hospital area. But Lord, we pray that you would continue to heal her. That you would restore her health. That you'd give her peace in her body. That you'd be with her. Lord, we pray for the family as well. Lord, help them to hope in you. Help them to trust in their God who is a very near and gracious and caring God. Lord, we pray for Sandy Caldwell as well, a friend of Bonnie Williams. Lord, she is scheduled to have heart surgery this week. Lord, we pray that you'd be with her. Be with the doctors. Give them wisdom and skill. Lord, be with her body. Give her strength and health. Lord, we also pray for Ray Fowler, a former member here at Mount Calvary who had a stroke two weeks ago and is paralyzed on one side. Lord, we pray that you would be with him. Lord, that you would help him. Lord, that you'd give him strength and restore his function. Lord, we pray that you would just do a miracle for him. And even in this hard time, Lord, we pray that you would bless him and that you'd bless Maddie, his wife. Please be near to both of them. Lord, please give Ray strength. Lord, we also pray for Lewis Harrison, who was in the hospital last week. Lord, as his body was retaining too much fluid. Lord, we again thank you and praise you that it seems as if there's gradual strength. Lord, there's gradual healing. Lord, we pray that you would continue, though, to be with him. Give his heart and his body renewed strength. Lord, help him to trust and rest in you. Lord, please bless him and the Harrisons at this time. Lord, we also pray for the hurting. Lord, the, the widows and the widowers, the single parents, the broken homes. Lord, there's many prayer requests that we often forget about and we neglect. Loved ones sitting right beside us uh, that we uh, don't bring to you often enough. Lord, we pray uh, that you would be uh, with these hurting individuals. Lord, give them strength, give them peace, give them joy. Lord, there's so many different people in different circumstances going through hard times, but Lord, we pray. Uh, that you would be near to them, that your word, your preached word, songs, prayer, would be near and dear to them. Lord, we also thank you and praise you for the ways that you've been blessing us as a church. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of Monte Calvario. Lord, please help the session to guide them as a group well in wisdom. Lord, please work in the group, and Lord, help us to be able to encourage and minister to them. Lord, we also praise you and thank you for Jim Stevenson and his desire to play piano for us and, and also be a part-time assistant pastor. Lord, you directed him to us. You worked through the whole process. Lord, you've uh, brought us a very skilled, wise, gracious man, and we thank you for that. Lord, in a time when we really needed someone, Lord, you you came and you answered our prayer, and I thank you and I praise you for that. Lord, now as we turn to hear your word preached, Lord, I pray that you would give us your spirit, that we would hear 
that we would see, that we would approach you, that we would follow you, that we would know and love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Three and four-year-olds are dismissed at this time to go to Children's Church. It's fun from up here to see their faces as they go, so pray for them as they go, and what a great thing that we have that opportunity. The rest of us, we're going to stand and sing hymn number 53, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Let's sing together. singing. Join me in your copy of God's Word at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I want to turn your attention to verse 17 through 23. Our sermon text for today. This is God's holy word. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. 
And therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we ask for your work of illumination in us, that we would see Jesus, that we would see the truth, and that we would be conformed to his image. Father, this is a, um, a little more technical passage of your word, and we praise you for it. But we ask for a special attention and insight and help as we hear uh, your word preached. Would you speak to us? Would we hear from Jesus today? We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, we come to a passage of scripture today where the explicit focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have a miracle that's being done. We don't have any healing that's being done. We're right on the heels of that. But we actually enter into some fairly technical language here. But I want to say that this passage is critically important to our understanding as to who Jesus is and what he can do and what he can do for us. Um, as I said before, no reference to the bread of life or no I am statement here as we find in other passages. But its central theme is crucial. Uh, J.C. Ryle said this of this pa uh, passage. He said, nowhere in the Gospels do we find our Lord making a more formal or systematic or orderly or regular statement of his own unity with the Father. He goes on and he says, nor do we find a passage of Scripture where we find uh, a more uh, clearly put reference to his divine commission and his authority and proofs of his messiahship. Well, it's the kind of claims that we find here, as Jesus is making these claims, it's, it's these kinds of claims that cause the Jews to want to kill our Lord Jesus. But I want you to think about this, and this is why I want you to pay very close attention to the text and to the sermon today. It's only because of the things that Jesus says here, and only because of the truthfulness of those things, that he is who he says he is, and he is able to do what he says he is able to do. In other words, to be the water of life, to be the living bread, then the things that are said here must be true. Now, as soon as we come to the passage, there are two things that jump out at us that we ought to do in response to this passage of Scripture. One is found in verse 20. Verse 20 ends with these words that you may marvel. And I believe that this passage is focused so that we will end up marveling about the person of the Lord Jesus. So I want that to be one of your responses today as you hear this uh, passage explained. Here's the second thing I think we're to do as we see this passage of Scripture, and that is to honor the Son as we do the Father. That's found in verse 23. Did you see that? That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father, and he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So we ought to marvel and we ought to honor. We ought to marvel at who Jesus is. We ought to stand back utterly blown away at all that Jesus is and all that he is able to do on our behalf. And we ought to honor him. We ought to exalt him. And we ought to exalt him as we would our Heavenly Father. Now, if we are to marvel, um, 
And in this case, we're marveling in a person, the person of the Lord Jesus. Um, then what does that require of us? Well, it requires that we know this person, that we come into a relationship with him, that we know about him to be sure, but that we know this person and that we hear from him, we hear what he is saying. Now, here's where we can run into a problem, isn't it? That sometimes we can say, you know what, I just wish the Lord Jesus would speak to me. And he does speak to us. He speaks to us through his word, and he speaks powerfully in passage of scripture just like this. And oftentimes what we can do is to say, wow, this is sort of technical. And, 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 and you've got to really drill down into to the details of these uh, seven or eight verses. And that's hard, and somehow we, we can come away saying, I didn't hear what Jesus said. There's a story that's told about Ingmar Bergman, and perhaps you'll recognize that name as someone in our past who was a, a well-known filmmaker. And um, it's said of Bergman that uh, at one time he was listening to some music, and, and he said he had a vision. And in this vision, he was in a 19th century cathedral, and in that cathedral was a portrait of the Lord Jesus. And he envisioned himself walking up to the portrait and um, shouting at the portrait, Speak to me! Saying to Jesus, or this portrait of Jesus, Speak to me and I will not leave this cathedral until you speak to me. And of course, in his vision, the portrait does not speak to him. And so his response to that was, it said that that year, that the movie that he produced was entitled The Silence. And in The Silence, there are several characters who despaired of ever coming into relationship or hearing from God. Now, it's just a, an illustration to remind us that we can struggle with the fact that we don't think we hear from God as often as we would like. It's like Psalm 73 where Asaph actually says there, does God know um, and is there any knowledge in the Most High? In other words, is God aware of my situation? I just wish I could hear from uh, the Lord. But I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, that God does speak to us and he speaks very clearly and he speaks very loudly, but he does so through his word. And he has given it to us and we must open our hearts and our minds um, to it and so that we might hear and know about the Lord Jesus and who he is. So, um, that's how Christianity responds to any challenge that Jesus doesn't speak to us. So if he does speak to us, what's our response? Well, the two things I mentioned to you before, we're to marvel. And I loved how Andrew led us in uh, the earlier part of worship, where we are to stand in amazement as to who God is. So we're to marvel, but we're also to honor the Son even as we honor the Father. So I want to give you four, probably five things that point us to marveling at the Son and honoring the Son. Five things that help us to, that cause us to marvel and honor the Son. Before I get there, I want to turn your attention to verse 18. In verse 18, it ends with this phrase, making himself equal with God. In other words, this was the estimation of the Jews here. That they basically said because of what he had done, uh, what the Lord Jesus had done, and what he had said, that he was making himself equal with God. And particularly in verse 17, when he said, the Father has been working until now, and I have been working. And they understood what Jesus was saying. And Jesus was saying that we are working together, that we are one in that work. And they clearly understood that to be um, a, a statement of rivalry with the Father, a, a rivalry with the Father, much like Satan would, would seek to rival God. Um, Satan coming in the garden and saying to uh, Adam and Eve, did God really say? He, he, he's just afraid that, 
um, as you uh, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you'll be like him. You think of Isaiah chapter 14, and uh, we have this presentation of uh, the intentions or the desires of Satan that he would be equal to the Most High. And this is how the Jews understood uh, what Jesus was doing and what he was saying, even in the healing of the man there at the pool of Bethesda. But this is not Jesus' angle at all, is it? He's not seeking to rival God as, as, as though he's, he's uh, attacking that and trying to usurp some sort of position. Rather, what he's doing here is, is he's speaking of the equality that he has with the Father, this Trinitarian equality that he has expressed in unity uh, in which the Son is so utterly submitted to the Father that the two are one in the works that they do. The son can do nothing by himself. Okay, so let's talk about these five things that focus us on and help us to and direct us to marvel and to honor, to marvel in the son and to honor the son as the father. Here's the first thing. The first thing is, is that Jesus tells us that he's one with the father in all his actions, that's the operative word, actions. They're one in their actions together. Look at verse 19. This is stated both positively and negatively. Stated positively and negatively that they are one in all their actions. Verse 19 says this. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say that the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, that's the Father, whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. Now, we've already talked about verse 17 where he says, My father has been working, I've been working, and we've been working together in all of the works that have been done. Now, the conclusion of that kind of language is, is that Jesus is saying that I am, in fact, deity. I am God in the oneness that they have together, the father and um, the son. And so this work has been carried on ever since creation. As the Father has been working, so I have been working. Whatever work has been done by God, the Father has been done by the Son as well. Every act that the Father has done from creation forward, Jesus is saying, I've been a part of that. Now here's, here's our problem. Oftentimes what happens is, is we will hear things like this and we will say, okay, Jesus is uh, trustworthy or we could marvel in him and honor him to the degree that he is a great person, that he has greatness, that he's been involved in these things. And somehow we stop short of coming all the way to the, to the realization that he is God. Now, the story is told about the ruins that are in Luxor, Egypt. Now, in Luxor, Egypt, the, the ruins there are 3,000 years old. And if we went there today, you'd see, among other things, a series of columns. And these columns are 12 feet in diameter. They're huge. And not only are they 12 feet in diameter, some are 60, some are 80 feet tall. And if we stood there, we would notice that there would be a column down towards the end where there actually would be a small house on the top of the column. And you wonder, how did this small house get on top of this column so high off the ground? Well, the guide would then tell you, well, uh, long ago, when this place was covered in sand, there was a farmer in more modern Luxor who wanted to build a house, and so he dug through the sand trying to find some sort of bedrock to build his house on and finally dug down to what he thought was bedrock, and he built his little house. Only the, the years went by, and the sands were blown away, and finally this site of ruins was excavated, and they figured out that this uh, man had not built his house on the bedrock, but it was built on a column. In fact, the column was 3,000 years old. And the house was not founded on that that was all that strong. 
And I think that that's what often happens to people when it comes to the Lord Jesus, is that they dig down to some sort of a, a quasi bedrock and they think, oh, Jesus is a great example. There, there's, a, there, there's a greatness about him only to realize that that's not really bedrock. That's a mere column that was sticking up out of the sand. And when the full excavation is done, then they realize they're not founded upon the bedrock. And what would the bedrock be? The bedrock would be that Jesus is God. Jesus is God Almighty. And that's his point in this passage of Scripture, trying to communicate to us exactly who he is. Don't simply think that he's someone who comes to the pool of Bethesda and has the ability to tell somebody, rise and walk, take up your bed, and he does. And that's the full extent of who he is. No, all of that points to the fact that he's God. And has all of the power of God himself. And so we're to marvel. We're to stand in absolute awe and reverence before him. And we're to honor him just as the Father. Okay, so that's the first thing there. The actions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing. The second thing is that we ought to honor, we ought to marvel in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his identity with the Father and how that involves obedience. The first thing is actions. The second thing is obedience. There's obedience to the Father here as well. If you look at verse 19, you get a sense that Jesus is in fact obeying the Father. As I said before, he has submitted himself um, to the will of the Father. That does not make him less than uh, the Father. Equal in power and glory, the same in essence, but there is subordination in function uh, between the Father and the Son. But, but we're talking about his obedience here. Verse 19, <clears throat> it says, Most assuredly I say to the Son, can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For what he does, the Son also does in like manner. In other words, it involves the will of, of the Son. In other words, Jesus doesn't obey like a robot where, where his, his mind and his will are disengaged. His mind and his will are completely engaged. In other words, when Jesus obeys, he, he is happy to obey. He is happy to do the will of God. Of course, he is God. Now, remember, Jesus is a person. And as a person, as the God-man, as the infinite God-man, he, as a person, has personality, which means he has intellect and he has feelings. And he was really tempted. He fought discouragements. But in all of this, he never disobeyed his heavenly Father. Now think about this in relation to us. We, we of course, when we're converted, we're given the ability to obey God. But obeying for us is a difficulty, isn't it? We always kind of want to go our own way and do our own thing. But for Jesus, he never wanted to go his own way. He never wanted to do his own thing. But he always wanted to do the will of God. And this is communicated in this passage. So here are these first two things, the actions of Jesus, the obedience or the will of Jesus, and here's the third thing. There's a third reason to marvel and to honor him as the Father, and it's found in verse 20. And that is this love between the Father and the Son and between the Son and the Father. The love uh, between the Father and the Son. Look at verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now he show him greater works than these. Most of the commentators say the comparison here is between um, what Jesus is going to do and having healed the man at the pool at Bethesda. You're going to see greater things than these. And, and that's a pretty interesting statement, isn't it? Because that's an incredible work of the Lord Jesus, to heal an organic disease that had existed at least for 38 years in healing this man. But um, 
I'm getting away from my point. Notice the love between the father and the son. Don't you tend to sometimes read things like this and say, well, yeah, of course the father loves the son, and his love is, is kind of like my love. I think I tend to do that, that I, that I project my, the quality and the extent of my love for anything or anyone on the Godhead, and that's incorrect. <laughs> that is woefully lacking, isn't it? Can you imagine the quality, the quantity, the depth, the beauty, the intensity of the love that the Father has for the Son and the Son for the Father? The perfect love that is there. <clears throat> we, we know from all of Scripture that God is love. That's what 1 John 4, 8 tells us, that God is love. It's at his very core. And, and this should bring great encouragement to us to know that at the heart of God, he, he is, in his essence, love. But let me ask you a question. How do you know that the heart of God is love apart from the Bible? How do you know that the heart of God is love apart from the Bible? Well, <clears throat> we don't. You see, my friends, what we know is, is that God is love through the nature and the actions of the Lord Jesus. Think about this just for a moment. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, we read there that it's the Son, that it's the Lord Jesus who declares the Father. The word is literally, he exegetes the Father. He explains the Father. He makes the Father known. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, as we observe the Lord Jesus and all that he is doing, that we get this understanding of the Father and who he is. And frankly, we get the understanding as to who the Father is in his love, his love not, and not just for the world. We know that John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave himself for the world. But also what we see is, is the eternal love of God the Father for God the Son. A love which moves the Father to reveal his deeds to the Son. That's what verse 20 says. Did you see that? In verse 20, it says, and he shows him all the things that he himself does. Why? Because he loves the Son. So here we see actions, obedience and will, this love, and here's the fourth thing that ought to cause us to marvel and honor uh, the Lord Jesus just as the Father. It's found in verse 21, and it's the fact that Jesus gives life. Look at verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now I want you to think about this just for a moment. You think about those whom the Father has given life. The Father has raised from the dead people in the Old Testament, right? Elijah raises the widow at Zarephath's son. Uh, Elisha raises um, the Shunammite's son. We see God raising people from the dead. But remember, God the Father also is saving, saving souls here. He's raising lost sinners who are dead in their trespasses and sins, who are completely and hopelessly separated from God because of their sin. He raises them to new life. And he started doing that way back in the book of Genesis, right after the fall. Do you understand that God's saving work began even before Genesis 15, 6. But Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And what is that? That's our first look at justification by faith alone. The imputed righteousness of the coming Messiah imputed to those who would believe. All the way back in Genesis, and God has been doing that. But notice what our text says. It says here in verse 21 that as the father raises the dead and gives life to him, even the son gives life to whom he will. Now, my friends, I want you to think about how incredible this is. 
Because it is the Lord Jesus Christ who saves souls. If you're here today and you rest in Jesus, meaning that there was a point in your life where you realized your sinfulness and that it was your sin that was separating you from God and having any relationship and receiving the blessing of life and you repented of those sins and turned to Jesus Christ and received him as your Lord and your Savior, well, then he saved you and he raised you from the dead and raised you to life. But my friends, do you stand in amazement of that? Why would he do that? Do we often think about why would God condescend to, to interact with me at all? He should have just passed over me because of my wickedness and my own idolatry. I want to be the king. I want to rule. I want to go my own way. And God says, no, I'm going to pursue you as the holy hound of heaven to come and to draw you to himself. But who can do that, my friends? Who can, in fact, draw us and do so irresistibly? Who can take the heart of stone and give the heart of flesh? Who can give the gift of faith so that we, in fact, will be saved? Jesus can. And we ought to stand back and say, Jesus, we marvel at who you are. We marvel at your power to save. And we honor you just as we honor the Father because you give life. My friends, that's what drives us to worship. That every day we get up, every day and certainly every Sunday, we get up and we say, Jesus, you are so worthy. I worship you. I stand in amazement with you. It is my job to stand in awe and reverence before who you are. He gives life. Even as the Father gives life. What an overwhelming thing. One last thing, a fifth thing that points us to marveling and honoring the Lord Jesus. And that is that he has had committed to him being the judge of all the earth. I want you to think about this for a moment. Look at verse 22. This is where it's stated. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. We could turn to passages of Scripture like Matthew chapter 25. <clears throat> and the Lord Jesus will one day return and he will separate the sheep, true believers, from the goats. Separate the wheat from the tares. And that is his prerogative, his divinely given prerogative. That is his power. He has the power to be able to do that. And whatever judgments he makes, they stick. Well, my friends, who can do that? You see, Jesus has laid out these five things to say, ultimately, what he's saying is, is I'm God. It's not a bragging thing. He's simply uh, trying to communicate to these listeners here in John chapter 5 so that they ultimately will, will recognize him as God, receive him, and receive all the benefits of being in relationship to him. Receive all the benefits of, of being in union with him. Think about this. If any man, any man at all comes to us and he's one with the Father, what do we do with that one? If any man comes to us and in his actions and in his mind and in his will, he's one with the Father, what do we do with that person? If any man comes to us and, and there is perfect love between God the Father and himself, what do we do with that person? And, and if we meet this person and he has the power of giving life, not just raising people from the dead and reversing physical death, but the one who has the ability to give eternal life to whereby we live forever in the portals of heaven itself. What do you do with that one? And if we come and we meet that person who in fact has been given the right and the privilege and the prerogative to be able to judge all the earth 
and to, to be able to decide who's a sheep and who's a goat, who is a true child of God and who's not, and he comes to us and we encounter him, what do we do? What do we do? Well, if we have never met him before, well, then we, <laughs> we turn from our sins and we embrace him in faith. We receive him. We turn from our sins that are damning us and keeping us from heaven, keeping us from this blessed existence with who he is, and we come into union with him by way of this faith. We trust him. We transfer our dependence, our, our trust, our, our eternal hope to him, not us, not our works. They certainly won't save us. That's what we do if we're lost and we don't know him. But what if we do know him? What, what if we know the Lord Jesus? What if we're in relationship with him? What if we're his children? What if we bear his name? What if our names are written in the Lamb's book in heaven this morning? What do we do with him? And we know that these things are true, that his actions are one with the Father, that his will is one with the Father, that his love is one with the Father, that his ability to give life is one with the Father, his, his right to judge the earth has been given to him by the Father. What do we do as believers? What do you do? Well, what you do is, is you give your whole life to him. You just don't give Sunday morning to him. You don't just give Sunday to him. You give him your job. You give him your vocation, your career. You give him your aspirations. You give him your family. You give him your children. Children, you give, you give him your parents. And you say, his opinions are now my opinions. His truth is my truth. His guidance is now my guidance. How can you say that? Because he's the one who is one with the Father in his actions, in his will, in his love, in his ability to give life, in his, in, in his, uh, his judgment as well. That's why we do it. What else would you do? What else would you do? C.S. Lewis reminded us that we can't separate the teachings of Jesus, and boy, we've been in the teachings of Jesus here in this passage. You can't separate the teachings of Jesus from his astounding claims about himself. He wrote in Mere Christianity, he said, either this man, speaking of Jesus, either this man was and is the Son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. And that's really true. You don't, you, there, there's no middle option here. There, there's no middle option, as, as I said before, of saying, well, he was a great example. He's really, really spiritual, and I want to be spiritual like him too. No, he's either the Son of God, the Son of Man, or he's crazy. Lewis goes on and he says, you can shut him up for a fool and you can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. And so church, what do we do when it comes to a passage of scripture like this? We put our hands over our mouth. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we respond and we give him our whole life. We give him our hearts. We give him our thinking. We give him our actions. We give, our, we give him our intentions and our aims. Have you? Have you given all of yourself, all that you are to him? That's what he desires. That's all this talk about marveling and all this talk about honoring. Have you done that? Is there a little piece of yourself that you've held back? Are there big pieces where you just say, well, I've given him this morning or I've given him this part of my thinking but, but, but whole sections of our existence untouched by the Lord Jesus. 
does he have all of us? Are you marveling in who he is? Are you honoring him as you would the Father? Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to say we love you this morning, how we praise you for your greatness and goodness. We ask that you would help us, that you would open our hearts and our minds to you. Oh, how we allow the, the world and all of the stuff in the world to clamor for our attention and our affections. And we miss you. We miss this gigantic draw that we would marvel in who you are, that we would honor you as we should. And we failed you. We have truly failed you. There's not one of us who, who has not held back a piece of our lives. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us descend in all of your power. Descend upon our hearts and snuff out all of those rival idols within us and help us to give ourselves completely to you. Would you help us to do that? We pray you would. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing How Great Is Our God as we close.
trepidation and fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.